The following interview was conducted with Dennis DePew, Dean of the College of Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, May 5, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good, good morning, morning. Dean Good DePue. morning. It's always good to see you, Catherine. Thank you. This is part two of an interview for the library's Oral History Program, which part one was conducted on December 3, 2008. Let's start out with the College of Technology statewide, 11 communities and a lot of satellite campuses campuses, growth and changes during your deanship? Oh, growth that. and changes. I yeah. think the, um, the good question, first let me say thank you. you know, thank pleasure. you for taking the initiative to make this happen, the oral history. Uh, I think down, we don't realize how important it is today, but I'm sure that 20, 25, 30, 40 years down the road we'll look back and say it was very, very important. Um, thank you. Uh, statewide technology, I think for us as a college we have always viewed it as an important component of our land-grant mission in you know, reaching out to citizens of the state of Indiana and uh, providing uh, primarily undergraduate educational opportunities for citizens in the state. And there's some wonderful success stories out there when, when everyone begins thinking about the brain drain in the state of Indiana. It's a tremendous investment on the part of the state because something like 95 percent of all the students who finish a degree program in statewide technology stay in the state, right. remain here. They used and oftentimes remain right there in their own communities. I would say probably the major change that I've witnessed uh, in the last nine years was as Ivy Tech Community College began evolving to become the community college that we're seeing it become today. Uh, it really um, uh, provided an opportunity for us to grow undergraduate, educa undergraduate education to the, the senior level. Most of the degree programs early on in statewide technology's existence were associate degrees, the vast majority. 75, 80 percent of the degrees that we offered out there were uh, uh, associate degrees in one of our disciplines. Uh, over the last four to five years, we've accelerated moving from offering associate degrees to offering baccalaureate degrees only, and also partnering with Ivy Tech and, and other institutions in the region to provide good two plus two transition. So if this student earns the associate degree at Ivy Tech Community College, they can take that two-year degree, bring it to Purdue, put the two years on top of it, and have a baccalaureate, baccalaureate degree at the end. So that's probably been the, the big change. Um, I think that uh, another one would be, that I'm really proud of, would be the fourth technology park in the Purdue system. Uh, there are four, of it, as, as we know, that, that have been developed over the last four or five years that began under Martin Jiski's uh, uh, presidency. But the fourth one uh, is actually in New Albany. Uh, and I, we actually have our degree programs and our faculty and staff are actually located on that technology park. Uh, it was a gift made to the university by John Shine, the John Shine family, and I had a role in, in that that gift, that gift to coming to Purdue. It was a gift of about 45 acres of land near the IU Southeast campus where we have our degree programs and uh, so it was a great location. Um, we're now in some new facilities but we're also embedded right at a technology park, much like the technology park here in West Lafayette. So I think I would highlight those two uh, things and, and the subsequent um, gifting that came you know, the fundraising through the Ogle Foundation and, and, and through the community that raised money to see that actually happen in a very successful way. So I would say those, those are two that would come good, to my sounds mind. Good. What about staffing on the faculty for these uh, in the statewide? Staffing. Are they local pretty much or very? That's a very good question. Most are local or um, maybe didn't grow up in that community but were transferred there. They had some connection with, uh, say, uh, a family member who was employed at Cummins Engines, for example, in Columbus. And so they followed a spouse there and right. um, rather than working at Cummins, they put on a faculty hat and became part of our faculty. Uh, but most are local or have some tie to that region of the state. Um, you know, and that's an important point because there have been a couple of times when we've tried to recruit individuals from those regional campuses to come to West Lafayette, and they don't want to come to West Lafayette. They want to stay there Where in the community are. and be a part of that community, and uh, 
that's a real testimony, I believe, to their commitment to not just the community, but to our mission in that region of the right. state. Good point. Um, student body. Uh, board, uh, uh, I think with statewide technology, the big change that we've seen there, and that's a, a, a very good question, if you were perhaps turning back the hands of time 10, 15 years ago, the vast, vast majority of the students in our statewide technology programs were working adults. They were working at some local manufacturing plant or business and they were taking courses in the evening. Uh, that was the vast majority of the students. What we would typically refer to here on this campus as non-traditional students. Right. Um, that has changed dramatically over the last eight or nine years to uh, the vast majority of the students today are really traditional age students. Uh, students that would look very similar to students you would see here in West Lafayette, the 18, 19 year old. Oftentimes though they're maybe bound to that region because of family or sure. they have part-time jobs or whatever, but we still do serve a non-traditional community. It has just gotten a little smaller over time uh, compared to the traditional age student. All right, okay. Is the fee structure, is it uh, similar to what the campus here or? Very similar. Okay. Uh, very similar. The, um, uh, the difference is that um, the tuition rate at the statewide locations that are affiliated with an IU campus, Kokomo, Richmond, IU Southeast, follows the tuition rate of the IU campus. Okay. So whatever IU charges tuition, that's what we charge. So it's, it's always the same. And so that's just a little different from the West Lafayette campus, but in terms of dollars, the, the difference is not all that significant. Right. Okay, okay. Um, career path for the graduates. Uh, career paths for statewide technology students typically are in that region. Okay. Uh, as I said, most of the students when they graduate stay right there. Uh, there's a small percentage that may migrate or move on to other opportunities, but oftentimes uh, these are students who, again, are bound to that region because of family or work or both, and, um, and they wish to stay in that community. Uh, what we do find is that it enables them to uh, in improve a career path. In other words, there may be promotions involved in completing a degree or new job opportunities in the region. Uh, but certainly we see a positive career path going in a, in a positive direction in terms of promotion or advancement in an organization. They can move up the, up oh, the ladder. Oh, yeah. yeah yes. That's good. Okay. Is there any liaison with TAP at all, the statewide technology? Well, actually there is. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, um, there is a TAP representation, a presence at the New Albany campus. So in that technology park, in that new building that was built by PRF, there's actually a TAP person there. Okay. Um, and our faculty who are involved in TAP here in West Lafayette usually connect with faculty, their counterparts or their colleagues in the region if they're working on a project with a particular company, Red Gold for example, okay. uh, or Cummins. And so uh, we find that the, it, there are collaborative opportunities for faculty in statewide because they link up with faculty here as well. All right, okay, good. Outreach and engagement, a uh, couple things that I want to talk about. One is that Boiler Tech Challenge in Columbus. You've done a lot of different kinds of things. These are the one that was down in the Boiler Tech Challenge that you had in Columbus in April. Yeah, that's, um, your, you know. Some of your new engagement things I was going to the, talk about. Uh, the, the, well, what's happening in Columbus in general, in my opinion, is pretty phenomenal. It, you, know, you, uh, you know, they have the new uh, facilities there that uh, the campus for IU, Purdue, and Ivy Tech in the Columbus area are second to none. They're just spectacular facilities, um, which enables you to attract really talented faculty with, and staff, which enables you to have things like the Tech Challenge. Uh, and it's an, uh, a very strong community, very supportive community, uh, and certainly very mindful of the importance of K through 12 education and attracting you know, young people into the STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, and it's been very strong because of leadership from government, local business leaders, uh, uh, educational leaders in the area. But mm -hmm. what they're doing down there is absolutely phenomenal. They have some incredible space. Actually, in June, in a few weeks, we'll have an opportunity to go down and celebrate the opening of that new facility. They'll have the Manufacturing Technology Center that's, that's in 
located in it that will be part of, the IU folks will be part of, and Ivy Tech will be part of. Oh, that's great. The Kokomo, now this, the four-year bachelor's program that you did, I thought that was kind of, the stimulus money was available yeah. for it, and that's why you had, for the associate, get the four-year within two years. Yeah, that, um, you know, that um, it kind of putting, just chatting about that for just a few yeah. moments. Sometimes when folks say, I remember the first time we launched that and, and we um, announced that you could earn a four-year degree in two years, everyone kind of thought, well, maybe you're dumbing it down. It's going to be a lesser degree. Now, the fact of the matter is it's an accelerated version. Sure. They, uh, they really put a lot, and that 24 months is packed very heavily. There's, a, uh, there's not a, uh, we didn't, shorten up the timeline of courses or the content or the experiences. It just um, a little bit more like drinking out of a fire hydrant, I guess, if, if you're a student. But um, that has turned out to be a huge success story, particularly in Kokomo at this time, because we had this, you know, serious economic downturn. There were downturn. There were a lot of people who were laid off in the Kokomo area. Um, provide an opportunity for people to retool, uh, to take that, that time off and some funding to advance their skills, get a college degree, and uh, the uh, retention rate in that program is pretty phenomenal. You'd like for the retention rate in all of your programs to be that good. Right. Uh, but it's been a big success story. It has. Is it still continuing? It is. Yes. Oh, okay. Is it, it is. So, so the I think, but that's a good question. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the next, say, two to three years. Right. Uh, will there be as much demand for, and, and we knew that when we launched it. You know, it was launched knowing that it was going to be flexible. We'd meet a particular need in the community. Sure. And if that need was met and the demand wasn't there, then we could go back to doing what other do. things, what we were doing all right. along. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. Um, you know, and of course, another success story has been the Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering Technology, but that's also offered at other locations around the state too. Right. Though so you're talking about acceleration, I think a lot of that was also done during the war. Some of these people had accelerated Purdue did and they moved up the graduations <coughs> and things. So it has, you know, been used other times, but it works. But and it's good. It's, it's worked very, very well. But but when you say two years sometimes I remember the first time we chatted about this in the provost office, they said how can you do that? Well it's you know you <laughs> they it, jump on the two. <laughs> they they jump on the two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the Anderson University, your flagship center, yeah. that's new. Tell us about, for the research, tell us about that one. Well, that's, um, that's the one partnership of all of the locations that is with a um, private institution. Um, but it goes way back, long before I was dean. You know, we had a presence at Anderson. Uh -huh. And um, the, uh, but that flagship center, I think, is a, is a, is a, a reflection of a strong visionary leadership from the Anderson University leadership, uh, the president, uh, Vic Lechtenberg, um, and in the engagement area, and community leaders, and and in us with statewide technology, envisioning uh, again when GM's big presence there right. shrunk dramatically. You know what are you going to do? And uh, it was to some extent like a lot of other communities that had to think about reinventing themselves, focusing on new industries and. Um, you know, now there's a, a big presence that's in the um, energy area, batteries and technology around electric vehicles, uh, food products. Nestle's has a big presence there, so food processing is going to be big. Uh, Red Gold certainly is in that in that area as well. Um, but that the flagship enterprise center really has been special. It's uh, another example, I think, in the state where uh, partnerships can can be cultivated and, and be sustained and, and flourish even with private institutions. Right. Um, but um, so that's, that's, a, that's a big success story. Yeah, that's very nice. Okay. The, um, you had a Southeast Indiana Technology Showcase uh, that uh, highlighting the Purdue Indiana Discoveries that was recent down there in uh, uh, just recently in, in April. They had some of the discoveries and things in that area. Yeah. Were you, did you go down for that? I didn't get to go no. down for that, but that, you know, that, uh, let me mention a, a, a person's name that we can get in the history books here, and that's Andy Schaefer. Dr. Andy Schaefer is uh, uh, the director of that particular location, and as well as providing leadership for the Columbus lo location as well. And um, 
Andy uh, has family connections to that region. He's one of the examples of uh, a faculty member, a leader who uh, has incredible talent and and has invested time and energy in making that community better. Better, and um, you know Andy's bit was part of all of that, and uh, he has been an incredible leader for Purdue and for statewide technology in that area. And of course, Dwayne Dunlap, Dr. Dunlap, who's our associate dean, but yeah. they've just done a fabulous job of again bringing that community together and uh, advancing. Um, K through 12 education, and and again trying to make um, provide experiences for young people K through 12 that could get them excited about careers that are technology or engineering focused, and um, I, that's just been fun to watch watch move forward. But I didn't have a chance to go down yeah, for that. That sounded like a very good program. It was. Um, Think Tech in uh, We Are Technology Makers. I think that was something in March that you did. Think Tech there was a program. A little bit about that. Technology. The now, which, which location think, was that? Uh, I'm not sure whether it was in any location. We are technology majors. Think Tech, it might have been a local one. Of, I right. think that was here on, right, that's on the campus. One that was here. Um, and that was good. I mean, you've yeah. done things for the community here, too. I think that, um, you know, Mary Sadowski, our associate dean for undergraduate programs, Tony Mingia, Jacqueline Brown, um, they have really done a fabulous job of, of focusing, trying to. Um, encourage and excite primarily minority and, and female students into STEM disciplines. And, and they've had huge success with that. Uh, uh, but a lot of the programs that are, are, that are like that one, the Think Tech, uh, and we'll have a whole series of them this summer that are really focused on, again, attracting young people to you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and primarily trying to attract more young women and minority students into these areas. And, They've been very successful with that. That's very good. The um, te could you uh, comment on the technology education program that's yeah. offered jointly <clears throat> with the College of Education? Yeah, our engineering technology education program is led by Dr. George Rogers. Um, it's a relatively small program, uh, probably eighty or ninety students. It's jointly. It's a. It should obviously, if it's an education degree you have to go through the certification process over in the College of Education, student teaching and all of that. But the technical part is actually taught in the college. Um, we have faculty in that program who have joint appointments with the College of Education. Uh, the really um, bragging point for that program is that each year that profession, that, that profession nationally identifies the number one program on a national level. And it's a competition. You, provide data and it, there's some metrics involved, reputation involved, number of students, quality of curriculum. And for two consecutive years, that program has been ranked number one on a national level. Very good. Uh, oh yeah. Very and uh, students are in demand everywhere. And the, that's one of the programs where a lot of the students, because of the nature of the discipline, may end up in other, other parts of the country. And so... What was, is the career path for those that are going to get that? Primarily teaching in, in public schools. Okay. They'll be teaching either in middle schools or high schools, and they would be teaching, you know, technology-related courses that you see as part of a curriculum there in a, in a, in a high school. We have them locally. Right. Um, a lot of the students do their student teaching in the state of Indiana, but it's highly, you know, we've seen these kids going to South Carolina, North Carolina, out in other parts of the country because they're in big demand. Yeah. They're kind of like math and science teachers. There's a shortage of them. That's right. Rankings. Your engineering technology degrees are tied for first in the U.S. and you award more engineering technology degrees to women than any other university. And that's great. It is great. It's yeah. uh, Part of that is just a function of, of our size. We are without a doubt the largest college of technology in the country by a huge margin. Um, a lot of our students come from a out of state, they're non-resident, um, so we do have an opportunity to attract large numbers. And when you do that, and you can attract large numbers of women and minorities, you have a chance to be a big player in that in that particular arena. Okay, your strategic plan: changing today, improving tomorrow. That's nice. Any couple comments? And a quote: "Keeping current with change is a challenge," and that's right. It is <laughs> a, a it big is. challenge. It is a big challenge. I think that um, um, trying to maintain and, and continue to create, an, and we've tried to create an environment or a culture where innovation could flourish. And uh, uh, change is not easy for anyone, but uh, I think we've done that quite
quite well. Uh, if you look in the college over the eight or nine years I've been dean, um, you know, there have been times when, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, anything in the area of life sciences just didn't exist in our college. And we're, we're a pretty big player in the life sciences area. Uh, we've had good examples of where faculty have taken an innovative idea and launched it to become a company. BATS, the Broadband Antenna Tracking Systems co Company that's launched by Lonnie Bentley and uh, Tony Smith um, has turned out to be a huge success. Uh, they now are, it's now a company, there's a present CEO, they have employees that are producing product. Uh, this product is actually being used by the Department of Defense, the military is using it. Um, uh, there was an example just recently where they used these two devices, uh, the military did, and dropped down into Pakistan. and. No one really knows what the purpose for all that was, but they dropped one device on one mountain and one device on the other mountain and turned them on. They began transmitting data back and forth. Uh, the military left, and um, about eight hours later, these things were destroyed. They self-destructed. Um, that was about a $100,000 price tag for that, that event. But, um, but it's turned out to be a huge success. But I think, again, creating an environment where we've been able to be innovative with you know, launching businesses, curriculum, launching graduate programs has been a hallmark of the strategic plan. Good. Now, the dean's view, any, the dean's view, 2002, 2010, and then the last one is the next stage. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll leave it up to you. The next stage. Well, I think that um, obviously, you know, someone once said, uh, will tomorrow be different from today? The answer is absolutely yes. And if you really look back at our history as a college over nearly 50 years, how we've evolved and grown and changed over time, um, uh, we have evolved from a handful of faculty, two or three degree programs in 1964, to, um, you know, s seven departments and 15, 16 degree programs, graduate programs, a PhD program that didn't exist 10 years right. ago. Um, I think we're on a good trajectory. Uh, I think the, I think we're on a trajectory that the college needs to be on to exist at a very large, very prestigious, land grant, research intensive university. Um, that's the path we're on. And, and I think if you look at how we've grown even sponsored programs and sponsored research, when I became dean, I think in 2002 we did $300,000 a year in sponsored programs and sponsored research. Last year we did about $12 million. We think this year we're going to be somewhere around $12 million. I wouldn't be at all surprised down the road if that number doesn't turn into $35 or $40 or $50 million a year. It's changed the way we, the way we operate as a college. Um, certainly it's caused a little angst. I mean, it's, right. you know, it's not been perfectly comfortable for everyone. Uh, but we have kind of changed our focus. We still try to I hope we never lose touch with um, the idea of at the very core of the college is providing high quality undergraduate education for students here in the state of Indiana. Right. That's job one. But coupled with that is graduate education and some component of discovery and engagement and um, how you do that, how you balance that all out is really, the, in my opinion, the secret. Uh, so that one doesn't dominate the other. And the other is that we've kind of moved through a period of time where I'm sure people thought of these things as being mutually in independent, mutually exclusive. Hmm. And, you know, high quality undergraduate programs and graduate programs and what you do in discovery and what you do in engagement are all linked together. And, um, you know, we now are witnessing undergraduate students being engaged in research with faculty hmm. in the college, which is, is a huge change. Um, so I think that we're on a trajectory, pretty steep trajectory actually, and I think as we, in the next few days, maybe next few weeks, uh, uh, welcome the next dean uh, on board, uh, we're on a good trajectory. The, the key will be, you know, that kind of leadership keeping us on the trajectory and moving us in, uh, in the right direction. So, uh, and I'm confident that the next person will be able to do that. Yeah. What about yourself with the next stage? Are you going, are you going back to teaching? Um, I, thanks for that question. I'm glad we're going to be able to get this in the, in the archives. Um, and I want to also make a point that the, the college has donated a lot of materials to the archives, and we really appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. We're, very, we're, very we're, nice. we're really grateful that they're in a safe place. Right. Um, we've talked a lot about that. Um, you know, they're Michael Hare supportive. really had a lot to do with right. kind they're of pushing supportive. that forward and emphasizing the importance of it. And so, 
you know, kudos to Mike for kind of keeping that out on the right. uh, on the horizon for us. Um, you know, Purdue's been very, very good to me, and you know that. In fact, I'm sitting here remembering the first thought that came into my mind was walking into Catherine Marquis's office a long, long time ago when I was trying to work on a dissertation and, and do my research, and and um, and you helped me tremendously. And that was back in the time when it was, you know, using technology for database searches was right. was a little different than it is today right. with Google and everything that we have. I understand. And, uh, so I'm a Boilermaker. You know, I have a Purdue degree and I love this place. It's been tremendously good to me and my family. I have uh, three daughters, two of whom earn degrees here. I have two son-in-laws who are Purdue Boilermakers and, and hopefully maybe someday I'll have a chance to see a grandson or a granddaughter walk across the stage and become a Boilermaker too. Okay. I always thought that it would be nice to end my career the way it began. Um, and it began as a uh, you know, assistant professor in the classroom, uh, doing some research, doing a lot of teaching, and I enjoyed that, enjoyed it a lot. And over the last 21 or 22 years, you kind of get in this administrative role, and, and it's been fun, no regrets. I hope I've been able to make a positive impact in some, in some way on the college. But we've always wanted to be able to go back and end it the way it began. Right. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, I was a Dwyer Award winner at one time and competed for the Murphy Award, but I sat on the stage with a guy named Jim Barony who won the Murphy Award that year. But uh, I was in good I was in good company. Um, I can't I think you. of anyone I'd rather be sitting next to <laughs> on the uh, uh, stage in Elliott Hall of Music um, when those awards are announced than my good friend Dr. Jim Barony. Um, I love teaching. Uh, I taught a class this semester actually. Um, right. And so I'm going to do a sabbatical. Uh, I'm going to leave July 1, and uh, I have applied for and been approved for a Fulbright. Uh, and we have had a great opportunity to build a partnership with the Dublin Institute of Technology. So Donna and I really hope, my wife Donna, we hope to spend some time this fall in Ireland on this Fulbright uh, appointment. Um, our goal is to come back next spring and uh, wear fewer uh, pinstripe suits and and uh, uh, teach. Uh, begin doing some writing. Uh, I hope to maybe get more involved with uh, our graduate program and advising graduate students. I very much would love to do that. Um, this is the next chapter in in life, and uh, we're excited about it. We think it's the right time, and um, we're looking forward to it. So sabbatical and come back and uh, get my hands dirty as a faculty member again. Good. Thank you, Dean Who. I really appreciate this. Thank it's you, very Catherine. Nice. My pleasure. Thank really you. nice. <laughs>